Thank you. I welcome everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was also asking to Costas to help me because I am more on the computer science area, and so this mix with the archaeological knowledge will be uh, very helpful. So um, I'm happy to be here, and I will uh, try to discuss together with you and share with you our experience on uh, precision archaeology. Uh, moving forward uh, to all the field of AI that is mixing uh, this idea and uh, using a lot of geographical approach. In the team, there are people coming from geomatics, from archaeology, for, for sure, and uh, from computer science. Uh, I will give a short introduction, then uh, we will move a little bit inside the AI methodologies that uh, we are um, using and uh, also giving a sort of research vision in these aspects. Then I will show you a use case that uh, is giving us a very, I think, interesting uh, preliminary results. And uh, we will discuss about future activities. Uh, I, I have a last a couple of call for collaboration at the end, and I will go to conclusions. So going very quickly on the introduction, why we need uh, this uh, set of tools about uh, risk assessment, I think is a very well-known uh, uh, problems uh, joined, strongly joined together with urban expansion uh, and heritage preservation. We want to be able to map and uh, know a lot about uh, uh, every time that we are doing uh, some uh, EV work, uh, uh, a, a new excavation, uh, and some of these uh, characteristics or some uh, of these analyses are mandatory in many countries. Italy is one of these, but almost every country in the European Union. And we need uh, a lot on uh, doing new geospatial analysis uh, in a very, very fast and accurate way. So putting together archaeology, geomatics, and AI, we try to design and collect a novel data set uh, uh, mainly based on uh, geographical analysis. Uh, also, we want to try to start designing uh, a benchmarking activities for all the AI community. You know that uh, for uh, computer scientists like me, this idea of benchmarking is always on the table to try to better understand if we are doing, uh, we are going well or not. So starting from this approach, usually uh, uh, everyone is still working with a lot of precision archaeologist uh, methods. Uh, they have uh, accurate mapping of sites. They can go there with the GPS and have a lot of uh, geographical information together. But uh, after that, we start uh, using GIS system. Uh, uh, and the, this is, again, a very common way of doing. Uh, but uh, there are uh, a lot of human hypotheses on the table. And this is what we want to try to uh, move forward from and try to add a lot of uh, uh, AI-based approach on this kind of a solution. That's why on the right of this slide, you can find the AI-enabling uh, approach that has more the vision of uh, having a data collection that is more ready for machine-to-machine -machine application and for AI application and for AI data sets more than for human interpretation and leaving uh, really at the end inside the human AI cooperation vision, the idea of uh, making interpretation over nice thematic maps. So starting from here, what are the current research gaps? So still now we are using uh, quite a lot of empirical solutions. So if you go inside the lab that uh, is doing precision archaeology, they are making a, uh, a lot of assumptions. I will tell you about from on that. And, uh, the other research gap is about is on um, quality and quantity of GIS data. So usually we have a lot of data on uh, very well-known sites, while we have uh, a few amount of uh, precise data and the collected data in a standard way when we go on uh, everything that is uh, uh, widely distributed on a wide area and space. And, uh, well, and uh, you know, in Italy, we have uh, quite a lot of high, high number of uh, sites also very distributed all over the territory. Finally, the biggest research gap for this work was uh, the uh, machine learning and deep learning and generalization ability and uh, uh, the benchmarking solution. What I mean by generalization? By generalization, mainly I mean generalization by epochs and generalization by geographical location. Still now, this is a very big open point, but still at the end of my presentation will be a very big open point where we can try to work together. So usually, how we try to move on, the actual methodology 
can be divided in, uh, if also we go on the state of the art, we usually have these four steps. We have precision mapping, then data collection together with digital elevation maps, uh, and then we make some human-based hypothesis. From here, we start uh, making some GIS integration. We use some uh, commercial open source software for making visualization. We try to put together different layers and uh, acting uh, also on a statistical basics, basis on them. We try to have uh, a nice map like the one that uh, you see here that is uh, something that uh, is a human, human interpretable, very easy to use, and uh, usually is grid-based. When I mean grid-based, you will you will uh, listen from me later on that uh, we will try to move uh, to a grid uh, with a cell of 10 meters by 10 meters uh, for every single cell, and we are uh, trying to uh, move everything here on uh, this new approach. So going step by step in this new AI methodology, that is also a research vision. When you see the, the green dots means that uh, we are there, when you see the orange one means that uh, we are still working on that. So first step is uh, the machine learning approach. Again, th there is quite a lot of state of art in this uh, field, but we can do much more on designing features and also on making standardization of these features for then making classification and the reuse of this classification on uh, GIS data. Uh, every, everything that you will see from my side will be based on grids, and every grid, uh, as I was mentioning before, is 10 by 10 meter. Uh, it's not an assumption. You can uh, modify every source code that we designed for this purpose, making the, the dimension that you want. But this is a, a nice point of view when we go on precision, because we try to stay on a very, very high level of precision. And also, the other motivation is uh, to increase the number of data that we have, to increase the point of the grids, because as you can clearly understand, when we have a quite big sites, usually we have uh, hundreds of uh, grid cells that are covering these sites, these archaeological sites. That's why we're using very, very small grids, like the one that I'm proposing here. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot of data. And you know I'm a computer scientist, uh, and uh, working on AI, having a huge amount of data is a, re a really crucial point uh, to work uh, and to move on on the right of this slide. So the second point is the deep learning approach. You know that uh, there is an hype uh, today on uh, this kind of methodology, but uh, the nice and interesting thing here is that we can reuse the equivalence that uh, one grid point is one pixel, and we can uh, totally move uh, everything that I will tell you today in uh, an image-based approach, coupling together different layers and giving it in, as an input of a neural network uh, these uh, sort of different layers totally using and reusing the same concept that a lot of computer vision and deep learning approach is using today. The final point is the graph networks. Again, in our field, in the field of deep learning, uh, 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 graph neural network and uh, deep graph networks are, are working well for a large set of problems. That's why we tried also to start collecting uh, data in a way that can be reused totally in a standard way inside the graph network representation. That means that one grid is a node and that, that every geographical dependencies that I will introduce in the next slides, uh, like for example visibility between different archaeological sites, uh, will be reported as edges in the graph representation. This is, a, I think, a, a nice vision. We are not at the, at the end of the story, but we are in the middle of the, the trip that is bringing there. But uh, again, the base should be very, very consistent because we want to reuse a different point of view from the AI point of view that are leveraging always in the same side. So now, what are the, the where the study is based? The study, I will be very quickly on that. Uh, and you can find a lot of materials. I will leave at the end our, our contacts and I will share these slides. The data are coming from the municipality of San Severino in Italy and uh, is a big area, uh, one, about 200 square kilometers. And uh, in the middle there is the Settempeda Roman city. There are a lot of archaeological sites over there and we use, a, we use a, the five different epochs and four different thematic maps you can see here. 
when I mean, mention thematic maps, again, everything is grid based with a 10 by 10 uh, dimension of cell. When I mention epochs, is mainly for generalization purposes. So our goal is to try to understand if we are able to generalize or not with different epochs with different data. So starting from the archaeological knowledge, uh, this is, for example, the Paleolithic sites. Uh, you see that we have uh, quite a lot of features that are totally inside the cartography of information that we can use. We have uh, only 11 sites. Please remember that 11 sites means 1,500 grid points, okay? Because it's 10 meter by 10 meters, and some of these are an entire city, eh? some of these sites. And you see that we have a lot of information on the geographical sites. Then we try to move on a little bit on the morphological cartography. It's a, it's a digital elevation model, nothing more. But the, the map, if we go in the uh, Paleolithic, as, you was, as I was mentioning, that uh, you see that we have a most presence uh, in uh, plains, uh, no high slopes, uh, no high level in terms of uh, uh, altitudes, and so on. And uh, then we can also try to find paths. Uh, this is the way we are trying to use it to extract knowledge from the archaeological knowledge and try to transfer this uh, inside something that is quickly reusable on the AI sites. What are paths? Means that uh, is uh, a minimum cost path that has been calculated every different sites, between every different sites. When uh, the path is too long, is more than two days, uh, we remove this kind of path. And every path is passing by a number of grid cells, okay, and is giving a value on the path on the number of grid cells. Just to give you an example, this path is affecting a lot of grid points that we have along the path. And that's why we can say that this single cell is also belonging to some path. Someone who was working, working through, this is, I, I think, uh, and Costanz can help me, the correct archaeological uh, meaning. And then we have the visibility. Hmm? It's not really interesting for the Paleolithic, but when we move to the Roman age, uh, this become more and more interesting. That means uh, uh, how, from, how far from this site I can look. Okay. Again, is a, a normal kind of uh, feature that is coming from a digital elevation model and are totally different ways of thinking about the knowledge that I have inside the GIS system. And if we move to the Neolithic epoch, we try to reuse the same concepts, totally the same, it's also to try to introduce a, a sort of data standards to, to move on on these slides. Again, a lot of general cartography information, the path mappings, you see that the number of paths are increasing and the average tra travel time is 56 uh, minutes by walking. And again, the Bronze Age, hmm, 13 sites, general cartography. You see that the visibility mapping is changing a lot. Okay, they, they, we, they started building on uh, something that has a higher elevation and a higher potential for visibility and the visibility, the visibility maps is changing totally. That's why we we start them going epoch by epoch, totally in the same way. Eh? Uh, again, the path, the visibility, the information, uh, the GPS, uh, and uh, we come to the Roman side. And uh, in these uh, uh, epochs, we had uh, a huge amount of points, of positive points, uh, 34 sites, and you see again that the path cartography was changing totally. Again, giving features to every path. So what I mean by giving features to every path, that every grid cells has a long list of features over there. And if we stay on the first step of my uh, path from machine learning to deep learning to graph network, we can totally reuse this kind of information. It's like having images with semantic knowledge inside when we go to deep learning. It's feature-based human and crafted features when we stay inside the machine learning and will be graph when we go to graph networks. Uh, in the first results that I will show you, we use a very common and popular and also quite old methodology that is the, the SVM. You see there are some parameters and these are the first results that we can gather from that. This is the results coming from the Roman epoch. I will show you only one step due to the limitation on time. 
You see also the accuracy, okay? If we remove the alpha or more than the alpha, uh, we can uh, redefine uh, and try to understand if the system is able to make prediction without any knowledge on that. And in the bottom part of this part, you know, you see also something that is going back to visualization because we want to go back again and have some, and not giving back to the archaeology something that is a couple of millions of grids. But we want to give back something that can be easy readable. This is the second results. A quite different parameterization with the lower and decreasing accuracy. But uh, this, the funny thing here is that when we went back uh, to the uh, comparison and to the discussion with archaeologists with two different maps, the second one, the one uh, with the green dots, that is the less accurate in terms of AI, is much more acceptable in terms of uh, understanding. Uh, mainly is, is because of smoothness of the probability that I have uh, here some sites and here not. And if we make a comparison with the, this, this uh, map on the right is the one that is used only uh, based on their knowledge and some statistical approach on GIS. is uh, totally handmade, let's say, in this way. The other one is the most acceptable one. But you see that almost everywhere, you see the yellow part, uh, are expected to have an archaeological content somewhere, while here you have something that is much more precise, going cell by cell, 10 by 10. So again, now we will need to move on on this part and going on the other step. I mentioned this um, uh, several times, but I want to move to the conclusion to leave some space also uh, for the discussion. What I, want, what I want to underline again is that the data that are behind these three different methodologies are always the same, uh, always coming from a nice cooperation with the archaeological knowledge. Uh, going to conclusion, um, if we uh, want to start working on that, uh, we need to have a set of thematic maps that is increasing and increasing and increasing. And I think that uh, if we discuss together, we can increase this set of thematic maps. Thematic maps means more features, more ways of understanding, more uh, uh, numbers for our neural networks. The, the final point, I think, is the most relevant for today. Uh, we are still far away from generalization. So if, we, if you reapply the learned features of the Roman age to the Paleolithic one, again, again, we are far away in terms of accuracy, while the acceptability of the maps coming from this approach is still very high if we go back on the archaeology to try to understand if the work is nice or not. Um, final steps on my side. Uh, two call for collaborations. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, about uh, reusing the standard idea of data collection and benchmarking also on your works and try to cooperate. Please contact us. We really want to uh, share this approach and that to try to understand if we, can, we are able to make uh, an end-to-end -end, uh, solution that is able to work on the Paleolithic, Paleolithic side from uh, Italy to Spain to Greece, reusing the same methodology. And finally, we are uh, running a special issue on precision archaeology on the ACM Journal of Computer and Cultural Heritage on JOC. So we are looking for co-editors and contributors. Again, feel free to contact us. Thanks a lot, and I'm open for questions.